I got a letter from a friend of mine with a contract he was going to sign. And I was astonished by the findings and the issues in the, that contract that was very re relevant for what the Nobel Prize winner said. talk about contracts between companies, is this a very common issue that the contracts are badly written? Obviously most contracts are good enough that companies keep working together and don't end up in court. But I think that uh, <laughs> there is a path, there is a hard and arduous path where the contract is kind of renegotiated and reinterpreted often and all the time because it does have some flaws. I think one of the one of the issues that people have to deal with with contracts is that contracts are a tool because the two parties have lack of trust. And because there's lack of trust, one side will attempt to uh, exert their will on the other. I agree with um, Tom's position on this because um, contracts are a negotiation exercise. And you typically attempt, as contract theory dictates, if you like, um, to find the sweet spot between the buyer's attempt to um, gain its um, advantage and the seller's attempt to gain its advantage. So there's a sweet spot between the two. And certainly when, the, when you look at contract theory, especially from the mathematical perspective, it always attempts to optimize the position between those two competing, if you like, um, uh, forces. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of see it. And I've, I've certainly seen contracts in my time which appear to be hodgepodges and mixtures, if you like, of other contracts where they've they've not really wanted to get lawyers involved. So there is a spectrum, certainly in my experience, of, of um, people and organizations who try to um, gain that advantage with sometimes quite um, illegitimate means, <laughs> dare I say. So yes, absolutely. Um, so. so I don't know if this was a bad example I got a hand of, but it was very sparsely written about what the should be done. Their underparts were very, very detailed. There were no obligations from either side. Probably they have taken an international contract and tried to apply it in Sweden. Well, well, Casimir, why do you think that happens? What is what is it that drives organizations to actually make that mistake? And I think all, all four of us would recognize that a, a, a hodgepodge contract or a contract without obligations is is going to be a trouble. I mean, I could see if they didn't know exactly where they wanted to end up. I mean, let's face it, it's very difficult to predict the future. However, without obligations and in a hodgepodge, uh, that goes to court in my estimation. Somebody, Somebody's going to that at some point. Why do you think they went down that path? What drove them there? I think that in this case, it's uh, the skills from both parties. I think that is why I got it from my friend and I recommended him not to say yes to this contract. So I, I was thinking, you know, the first negotiation skills course training I took, they said, you know, don't be too good at negotiation because if you win, you will end up with a deal that the other party will hate. And, and you can't, uh, you, you'll not be able to execute on it. Well, I guess so. it's possible. Um, obviously, you know, uh, Ethar pointed out that, that we were looking for a sweet spot at the beginning. Is there, is there a, any fundamental rule in that, that discussion that says we want to be win-win? Or, or is it truly because it is a negotiation more of a win not lose too badly scenario. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very valid question. I mean, this probably ties in quite nicely to onto, onto the idea of vanity metrics as well, because what you often find is that organizations may not value the same things in the same way. So uh, the typical supplier uh, or vendor relationship with most companies often revolves around them getting cash for as, as much of the stuff as possible 
whilst not necessarily satisfying the end-to-end -end goal of the client themselves. And where there's this misalignment, um, there is the lack of trust or there's a lack of va precisely alignment of value, I think. And that consequently means that with in, in two different directions, if you like, you will get situations where some people will either attempt to trade off something really important for something the client doesn't consider as important or the, the, the vice versa may be true where they may, they may decide to give on one, um, well, if you like, to the client, so the client says it's important, okay, you can have that, um, but by the same token, take more of another variable. So it's the, it's the old kind of not aligned at all, and they they have been almost pulled under them to their position. You're absolutely right, Tom. You'll get a situation where they will hate it. And we, we in the UK certainly saw that. So it's, it's kind of about one month of negotiation and 12 years of execution on the contract, if you see what I mean. And that can actually be a massive problem, as you can imagine. Um, so they're kind of kicking themselves and making this one word change somewhere down the line. Um, the way procurement is, is is done is one example, if I was to present an example to yourself. Um, because often the companies are really, they don't trust. And that, that was mentioned earlier in this, obviously, this talk. And because they don't trust the vendors themselves, they impose a very hefty or difficult process to obtain that trust um, in the way procurement is carried out. Um, though realistically, it's procurement or that trust is based on two variables, not just one, risk and value associated with that risk. So if you're procuring a vendor product that is, I don't know, 10 million pounds worth of licenses and takes six months to migrate from your existing system into that, then there's two aspects. The first of all is the risk that it goes wrong. And if it does go wrong, what happens <laughs> if it does go wrong? So people put cotton wool around themselves by imposing quite difficult or tedious processes, which in itself actually costs the vendors quite a lot of cash. So the people that can help with that often get off it, especially in certainly UK procurement rules. Um, now, if you think about trying to change that, you could argue the case that, well, requirements are broken up into thinner verticals. And if you think about that, that means the value at risk of each one is significantly lower, um, even if it does have the same probability of going wrong. So but Ethar, it, do, do you really see that thinly slicing, you know, slicing them into, into different chunks as a mechanism to, I mean, I understand how it reduces risk, but at the mm. same time, since, uh, especially he, at least here in the States, governmental procurement isn't, uh, there isn't an economy of scale and there isn't, you know, so, so the cost of doing the big one and mm. the cost of doing the little one are relatively similar. We, we have to fundamentally understand that both parties in the equation probably have different different economic objectives in the end. It may be that there's you know some degree of overlap in terms of, of satisfying a need from the business side and satisfying the customer from from the the sourcey side. But but at the same time they're both attempting to maximize the value that they're delivering to their stockholders. Yeah. And that's that's not delivering and sometimes that's value, sometimes that's functionality, but a lot of times that's just flat out uh, money and profit. Yes. How do we, how, that's the trust barrier that I see. That's why, especially with these big things, right? That's why I think it's involved because people are afraid. Um, here in the States, if you get a procurement wrong, and you do it really wrong, somebody's going to look for your, you know, not only look for your job, but attempt to, you know, throw you in prison, perhaps kind of stuff as, yeah. as, as, as doing, you know, being, being illegal. Mm -hmm. All of these things are barriers to trust. Obviously, small things, measuring the right things, all are, are good things that we all agree on, I think. Mm -hmm. yes. But I don't necessarily know that procurement folks and and then politicians, <laughs> at least in in the in, in the side of governmental procurement, would would agree to that. Yeah, which which is correct in what you stated there, especially around um, the uh, elements of procurement and how they prefer to bunch that stuff, sort of stuff up. If that makes sense, it's one thing to them. But being realistic, 
thinly slicing stuff actually does reduce the risk around it. Because if you look at projects that have run in the past, a lot of smaller projects tend to deliver much, much better than one very large one. Because the, the risk associated with the probability, if you like, of it going wrong, even if the costs are the same, is, is, is different. But I think you're absolutely right. The procurement people don't really understand the end-to-end -end value in that. Certainly, I found that anyway. To, to absolutely agree with you on the point of trust, because the economic objectives, if they're not aligned, you will get that situation where the economic objectives of one person is going sort of horizontally, if you like, economic objective of the other people is going vertically. So it's, it's, it's you know, perpendicular to one another. That's, that's a disaster waiting to happen. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs>